or I think you know, that on March 21, 1943, the first ground was turned to start the reactor areas of Hanford. And on March 22, 1943, the first ground was broken to start the federally owned town of Richland. Most of us who came in 1943 came only to stay five years. What we were doing was secret, and on August the 6th of 1945, we found out what we came here to do. Many of us have remained and have witnessed the many changes that have taken place. And tonight, we celebrate these achievements of 25 years ago with the many distinguished personalities, industrial leaders, and just plain people who made it all possible. To all of you, we of the city of Richland salute you and at this time, may I ask the Vicar General of the Yakima Diocese, the very Reverend William J. Sweeney, to give the invocation. I would ask you to rise, but before you do, immediately after the invocation, I would like for you to remain standing and in a moment of silence, after which Father Sweeney will give a short prayer in the memory of Senator Robert Kennedy, who was just recently assassinated. May we all rise, please. Father Sweeney. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty, everlasting God, who alone works great wonders, pour down upon our city, upon us, and upon the leaders of our city, and upon all committed to their care, the spirit of your saving grace, that we may truly please you and grow with our city under the continual dew of your blessing. May we be recipients of your choicest favor and bearing in mind of our limited time for acquisition going, therefore, about the business of life, especially solicitous to employ what time we have to the greatest advantage, our city fathers have given us such an example. We are grateful and beg a blessing on their efforts. Amen. O oh God, the creator and redeemer of all the faithful, hear our supplications. And through thy infinite love and mercy, graciously grant to the soul of thy servant, Robert Kennedy, eternal rest. O most merciful Father, who knowest the weakness of our nature, bow down thine ear in pity for his family. Through their tears, may this... <coughs> May we look weakly up and meekly up to you, the God of all consolation, to Christ our Lord. Amen. And now in keeping with this 25 years, of celebration as far as we are concerned for the project, I'm sure that many of you do not know that on June the 2nd of 1943, Father Sweeney came to the Tri-City area to take his position in the church in Kennewick. And along with this, he had a mission assignment for Richland, for Hanford, and for White Bluffs. 
And the first Mass that Father Sweeney said in Hanford was in a tent. And it wasn't too good. It leaked, and it was raining. On June the 11th of this year, he celebrates the 30th year as an ordained priest of the Catholic faith. He and his parishioners <clears throat> were responsible for the beautiful Christ the King Catholic Church and the convent, and they're contemplating a new church to replace the wartime structure that was built in 1943 and dedicated on December the 24th. Father Sweeney has the distinct honor as the clergyman with the longest tenure of service to his community, and I would like for all of us to, together with applause, greet him on the 25th anniversary of coming to this area. Join me. And now, if I may make a few announcements prior to your being served dinner, and please go ahead and eat your <clears throat> salad so that it won't wilt, uh, if it hasn't already, or is it all gone? Are you waiting for the main course? I'd like to remind you <clears throat> that on June or July the 14th, the pioneers of Richland, the community of Richland, prior to 1943, will be celebrating their 25th anniversary. And sorry as I can be for the city is the fact that all these 24 years prior to this time, because of the hardships, anguish, disturbance, whatever you want to call it, of the eviction that had to come in order to make way for the project, these people have very graciously consented to come back to Richland on July the 14th. And I would say to all of you who are Richlanders that I hope that when they meet in Riverside Park that all of you will make yourselves available and welcome back those people who, shall we say, we replace. And we certainly, if there are any of those who are here, ask them to continue to come back to Richland for their annual picnic rather than going to a neighbor city. Also, on August 3 and 4 of this year, those people that were evicted from the Hanford White Bluffs Priest Rapids area who have been meeting elsewhere have chosen to come back to Richland to celebrate their 25th anniversary. They likewise are going to meet in Riverside Park. So on July 14 and on August 3 and 4, I hope the citizens of the city of Richland will give a warm welcome to the pioneers prior to 1943 of the former Richland people and the former Hanford White Bluffs people. There are some in the crowd, I know. I'd like to remind you that on December the 10th of this year, Richland will celebrate its 10th anniversary, and we hope appropriately to have some kind of a similar celebration as we have had today for the 10th anniversary 
of the 2510, as we have chosen to call it. I'd like to tell you that immediately after the banquet tonight, at the reception desk, there will be copies of the Richland History brochure that was especially prepared for this 2510 anniversary. The Richland JCs will be at the reception table in the lobby. They will have them. They are $1 per copy, and we encourage you to buy them. Also, at that same table, the anniversary tickets which you gave up tonight in order to come to the banquet will be on that table, and they are yours as souvenirs of the occasion. So if you would like to have your tickets, we'll be glad to give them back to you, uh, and you can pick them up in the lobby. And the 10 years as a first-class city under the statutes of the state of Washington, I am so proud of the remarkable transition that has taken place at Richland as headquarters of the Hanford Project and the job the Tri-Cities areas where today private industry is creating an estimated 1,700 new jobs as a result of the diversification and segmentation program. May Richland's second 25 years be as productive in proliferating the peaceful atom as the first 25 years in fulfilling our nation's military and national defense needs. Best wishes, Congresswoman Catherine May. I'm sure that many of you who were here in the years of 43, 44, and 45, will know this gentleman. I regret it will be impossible to share with you on this important occasion on the 25th and 10th anniversary of Richland. Richland will always be an integral part of my life, for old Richland was my first parish. I was married in Richland. My first child was born there. My wife and I hope to attend the July 14th reunion. God's blessing upon the event of these days and as Richland faces the future of greater days, signed Reverend Kenneth Bell of the CUP Church. I would like to say to you that in the early announcements about this celebration for this weekend, one of the things that we had hoped to do was to dedicate formally the George R. Prout Memorial Swimming Pool by having Mrs. Prout here. I'm sorry to report Mrs. Prout had to undergo surgery some time ago, and her physician felt that in her best interest she should not come at this time. We hope that Mrs. Prout will be here for the July 14th celebration, and that at that time we will formally dedicate and will present from the General Electric Company a gorgeous bronze plaque which will be on the swimming pool in honor of George R. Prout, whom I'm sure many of you know. And Mrs. Prout sends her best to all of you for this 25th anniversary. sure that all of you are, at least to, to us up here, it sounds like all of you are thoroughly enjoying yourselves. 
I would like to think that sometime along the way there ought to be some way that these, uh, all these reminiscing sessions and all the people telling all the stories they can think about are, wow, boy, we're on tonight. <laughs> But just prior to getting underway, and while the rest of you are finishing your dinner, let me just make a few brief comments of some of the people who we have heard from who I'm sure you'd like to know something about. First of all, let me say that all of the commissioners of the Atomic Energy Commission, Commissioner Ramey, Commissioner Tate, and Commissioner Johnson, send their best to us for tonight. Unfortunately, they're not able to attend, we understand, as many of the others who we have extended invitations to. We only wish they could be here to have celebrated with us this 25th anniversary. We received a letter from a gentleman whom I first knew back in 1946. And he was the principal speaker at a banquet of which one of our honored guests, who we'll hear from earlier tonight, sent a proclamation. At that time, he was the, direct, uh, the uh, district engineer for the Manhattan District. And he was, at that time, the only person in Richland or at Hanford who was in the West Stands in Chicago when the first experiment was successful, and that was Bill Overbeck. Bill, I'm sorry to report to you, sends his regret. He's in Houston under cancer treatment, and he sent his best to all of you. I'm sure you will be delighted to know this. One of the other former gentlemen whom we heard from who was the first manager under the General Electric Company, Dave Lauder. Dear Mayor, it is indeed with deep regret that I must decline your kind invitation to attend the portion of your 25-year celebration scheduled for June 7th. It is a wonderful opportunity to catch up again with activity and to review acquaintance with many fine people who were an active part of a modern miracle. I have always had the highest regard for the wonderful and capable people that composed the plant and the city operating group. I salute you and all the citizens and workers of Richland on a past of glorious achievements and sincerely hope that it is but a sound foundation for the future that will make the whole world envious. Signed, D. H. Lauder. Another letter and a name that was mentioned, at least for my part of the activities today in the program this morning at the reactor. Thank you for your letter of. April 30th, inviting me to the 25th anniversary celebration of the Hanford Atomic Energy Project. I regret so much that I cannot be with you on this important occasion since I will be in Sweden from the end of May until mid-June, and that is an engagement of long-standing to which I must give priority. I have often wanted to come back to Richmond, which I have not seen since I left in the, in the, for the last time in 1945. I am sure the intervening years have brought many interesting changes. I wish you all a success in your celebration, and I'm sorry I shall not be with you. Signed, C.H. Greenwald. We have a letter. Dear Fred, May I congratulate you on the anniversaries which you are celebrating. The development of the Hanford plants and the consequent growth of the city of Richland are events which are indeed worthy of celebration. I regret that my schedule prevents me from joining you, 
However, I send my best wishes to you and the citizens of your fine city for a successful celebration. Sincerely, Dan J. Evans, Governor of the State of Washington. Many thanks for your letter of April 8, inviting me to participate in the festivity scheduled for June 7, 1968 in Richland. This is indeed an outstanding occasion. I deeply regret that due to the long time previous commitment, I will not be possible for me to be with you on that day. I appreciate your thoughtfulness in inviting me. Please convey my congratulations and best wishes to all. Sincerely yours, Henry M. Jackson, United States Senate. Dear Mayor, many thanks for your letter of May 23, enclosing a copy of the preliminary program for the Richmond Anniversary Activities. I wish I could be with you for the at least part of your activities. However, the leadership has announced that a determined effort will be made to adjourn the Congress by August 3. This means that all appropriation bills and other legislation must be enacted by then. Thus my time away from the Capitol up to that time will be very limited. I do wish you the best of luck in what looks to be a very fine program. Best regards, sincerely, Warren G. Magnuson, United States Senate. I am very sorry, but I have a legislative council meeting in Yakima on June 7th and have to be in Spokane on June 8th. So it will be impossible for me to be with you, sincerely, Dan Jolly, state representative from the state of Washington. I would like to express my appreciation for the invitation to participate in the Richland Anniversary Celebration of June 6, 7, and 8. This presents a particular difficult problem for me my oldest son is graduating from high school and the commencement exercises will be held on the evening of June 6. On June 7, I will be transporting my sons to Seattle so they can embark for summer jobs in Alaska and I must present the commencement address at Centralia College. Thus, much as I regret it, I fear that I will be unable to participate in any of the activities scheduled for the anniversary celebration. I appreciate your invitation and if my schedule has changed, I shall make every effort to participate. Sincerely, Mike McCormick, State Senate of the State of Washington. <laughs> These are only but a few of the many, many, many very nice letters that we received from all of the people who we sent invitations to, which number something like about 200. I'm surprised that Mayor Claggett doesn't have a cramped hand from signing his name on all the invitations, but very graciously he did. I'll not read any more, but those are the ones that I thought you might be interested in hearing about from all of those that we have. Thank you. Preliminary to our getting underway here, which we're going to do. I would like to say to all of you that this morning at the 105B reactor and at the T Canyon in 200 West area, were probably two reminiscing sessions that will go down in history as far as nuclear energy is concerned. Unfortunately, I was not privileged to be at the one at West this afternoon, but I was at the one this morning at, 10, at the 105B area. And I can tell you that I don't ever recall of hearing such delightful stories of what happened, and why it happened, and how it happened, and so forth, as the gentlemen who were on the panel there. And I'm sure those that went on to the Tea Canyon again had a delightful time over there listening to 
the gentlemen who participated in the panel, which some of them you will hear from tonight. I only wish that it were possible that all of you could have been able to have attended and heard all of the things that were discussed and at least been privileged, as many of those were, to stand in front of the first production reactor that was built in this country and the first chemical separation plant that was built in this country, and it was all done right here. And a lot of these people that are sitting up here at this head table are the people that are really responsible for everything that was done. Along about December the 10th of 1958, it was necessary for Richland to make a choice. It was a choice to continue under federal ownership, or it was a choice to, shall we try it on our own? And we chose to try it on our own. The issue was brought before the people, and the people decided that this was the time to change. With the help of the Congress of the United States, with the help of the legislators of the state of Washington, both in the House of Representatives and the Senate, we were able to attain that goal on December the 10th of 1958. One of those men who was responsible in a large measure of the work that went in to do all of this is the gentleman I'd like to introduce to you at this time. He's the one citizen of the city of Richland who has the distinct honor of serving longer in municipal affairs than any other person. He served eight years from 1950 to 1958 as councilman and mayor of the advisory council and 10 years from 1958 to 1968 as councilman of our first class city. He's now our mayor. Ladies and gentlemen, to give you the official welcome of the city of Richland, the Honorable Fred Claggett. Fred? Thank you, Chairman Beardsley, General Groves, Dr. Seaborg, honored guests and friends. <clears throat> you know, the news this week was a bit sobering, numbing, a shock, and for a fleeting instant, it passed through our minds should any changes be made in this particular program? After all, this was scheduled, intended to be, and is a celebration. It raises a question of the appropriateness. However, these were quick reactions. Re reflection shows that the problem of people living together in cities peaceably and with respect is with us. As a mayor, I feel it important in conjunction with this celebration to repeat the fact we as citizens of this country cannot forget the fact that we have a problem and the nationwide events increase our dedication to a solution. However, we are glad that we have this evening, today, the occasion whereby we may gather here in fellowship and friendship, reflect on the teamwork, the working together, the associations which have been established in the past, and to look ahead. 
we are demonstrating here again that we do have common bonds. Now, so far as this program is concerned, it was on January 2 that I announced that Paul Beardsley had accepted my appointment as the general chairman of this program. He immediately went to work with, with AEC, and the problem of everyone trying to find around the country a lot of people who had been involved, some whose locations were apparent, some who had been gone for a long time and uh, moved around some, not so apparent maybe to us here who were relative newcomers. We had a lot of fun doing this. Along in March, I contacted the Merritt Company regarding facilities for this event. Some of you may not have yet have caught up with the fact that uh, uh, we are going through a transitional process here. Those that you real old timers <coughs> knew as uh, uh, TQ, the transient quarters, has uh, as of a week or two ago ceased to exist, an auction tomorrow, and thereafter the building disappears for replacement by a new one jointly done by Atlantic uh, Richfield, uh, Hanford Company with uh, the Vance Hotel chain. This one, not yet quite ready, but the Merritt Company, Jim Zarelli assured me that, uh, and Tom Hill, the local manager, said, uh, uh, we will accommodate you. And in one way or another, they have. <laughs> when, I, when I say in one way or another, I do not mean this in any derogatory sense. You have had to step over construction. This, I think, has become the signature or the signpost of Richland. You know, my wife and I are, uh, by some of your standards, relatively newcomers. We arrived here in 1948. I arrived in the middle of uh, construction of Hudson houses, A&J houses, ranch houses, waited six months for a house. She came along later and arrived in the middle of one of our worst dust storms of that year. So uh, had a good indoctrination. <coughs> Since then, we have been stepping over construction continuously. And as I say, this is our signature. We uh, can assure you, those of you who are visiting here, that we intend this to continue. Helping with us in this, incidentally, has been the Tri-City Nuclear Industrial Council, which is helped us go through a process of transformation of new jobs. We are glad to have you join us in the celebration of the past and see us as we are looking ahead. Incidentally, speaking of doing things in a big way, uh, I mean this, we uh, literally wanted to roll out the red carpet for you. And if you look at the floors, you will note we have a red carpet. This red carpet came from Virginia. A shipment was made by air freight some time ago. When they began laying, they found that somewhere, some of it didn't arrive. So on uh, search, they found it was back in Virginia. This, ladies and gentlemen, was two days ago. <laughs> two days ago, I kid you not, the, the carpet in the hallways was in Virginia. Since there was a goof somewhere by the air freight people, they, at their expense, sent it out by passenger plane yet to get it here. <clears throat> So, 
th this uh, is kind of a sign of the times, I guess. General Groves and uh, Colonel Mathias did the construction job years ago. We're not doing it on the scale they did, but uh, we're still trying to uh, continue the practice. Now, we are honored to have our out-of-town guests here in this reunion. It's great for us. Some of us who have been here a, a while have not had the privilege of meeting some of you who helped to establish things here. We have been glad to get together. We have a history and a heritage here which has been kind of piecemeal, and we decided that this year was a good time to try and pull the pieces together. And with, the, with our gratitude to the tremendous assistance of Dr. Seaborg and the Atomic Energy Commission in repeating, reminiscing, and recalling and recording what has happened and why, along with uh, where we are now. We're glad that you all could visit. We're glad to welcome you among us. We hope you will come back again. Incidentally, I perhaps should say, uh, Paul referred to a letter to Senator Magnuson on May 23rd. I would like to assure you, uh, just in case you get a wrong impression here, uh, of being a uh, uh, Republican and referring to a, uh, uh, a Democrat senator, I shouldn't say the non mayor's nonpartisan office here, but anyway, pe people locally know, know the political picture. Uh, I had been pursuing the senator for some time, and his first comments were that, uh, about a month or two before that, were that uh, he thought he might be able to make it, and I had, was simply putting the last pressure on towards the tail end to see if there was any chance that he, uh, he might, but he was unable to, as were Senator Magnuson and Catherine May. Washington is a long ways away, and we regret their absence. Now, uh, I... Uh, <laughs> Our, their absence here. We're glad they're back there. <laughs> Again, my uh, yippee, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll I'll sit down. <laughs> shall, shall I turn it around or just let it go? <laughs> we're glad they're representing us anyway. We wish they were here with us today. <laughs> and we're glad of those who could come today that you are here, and we do hope you'll come back, and thank you all. Thank you, Mayor Clagan. If I may continue for a moment and get just a wee bit serious, On October the 16, 1805, 163 years ago, Captain William Clark of the Lewis and Clark Expedition was the first white man to stand on the south bank of the Tapteal River, now the Yakima River, on Bateman Island and looked north at what we know now as Columbia Point. Prior to Captain Clark's arrival to the site of Richland, it was called Shemi, for the Shemnapum Indians, or the Horned People. Many things took place during the next hundred years, including Washington becoming the 42nd State of the Union on November the 11th, 1899, in October 1905, the first post office was established in the town known as Benton. And in 1906, the name of Benton was changed to Richland as a result of a contest to rename the community. The winner was given a city lot where the village theater now stands. The oldest building that remains in Richland marking this early history is the concrete block building on the corner of George Washington Way and Lee Boulevard where the travel agency is now located. 
This building was originally two stories, and the Richland Bank was located there. It was built in 1909. Richland was first incorporated the first time in April of 1910 and disincorporated on November the 25th, 1948. Until February of 1943, Richland was a quiet, thriving farming community with many fruit farms, asparagus fields, and grape vineyards. Little did any of these people living in Richland know that in late 1940 and early 1941 were there four highly skilled scientists who had discovered what was to be manufactured at Hanford. One of those four men are here tonight to help us commemorate the, be the beginning of the Hanford Project 25 years ago. The story from 1941, from 1940-41 to December 2 of 1942 was almost like reading the Buck Rogers comic strip and at 3.30 p.m. on December 2, 1942 in the West Stand, Stagg Field, University of Chicago, Another milestone in history was made when Dr. Arthur Compton, in a coded telephone call to Dr. James Conant, said, the Italian navigator has landed in the new world. Dr. Conant replied, how were the natives? Dr. Compton replied, very friendly. This marked the first time that man had achieved the first self-sustaining chain reaction and thereby initiated the controlled release of nuclear energy. As a result of the accomplishment by Dr. Enrico Fermi, who was known at Hanford by the name of Mr. Farmer, and many other notable scientists and engineers, the Hanford Plutonium manufacturing process was born. To direct the construction of the Hanford piles, as they were called then, the assignment was given to the Manhattan District Corps of Army Engineers by the federal government. The Manhattan District enlisted the help of the I. DuPont, Dina Moores and Company to construct the project. Two of the three men who directed the activities for the Manhattan District at Richland are also present tonight to share with all of you their memories and their experiences of 25 years ago. Temporary buildings, barracks, a hospital, police station, fire station, administration buildings, theater, business houses, mess halls, taverns, bank, an auditorium had to be built and operated at Hanford for the convenience of some 51,000 employees. The DuPont Company then became the employer, the doctor, the policeman, the fireman, and the nurse, as well as the construction contractor for the manufacturing areas and the building of the town of Richland. In 1946, the DuPont Company was replaced by the General Electric Company to operate the plant and the community, and they assumed the role, then the employer and the landlord. After several hard years of work by the Richland Advisory Council, the Atomic Energy Commission, the General Electric Company, self-government became a reality. And on December 10, 1958, after the city charter was approved, the first city council elected, Richland became a first-class city of the state of Washington. In 1964, the Atomic Energy Commission and the General Electric Company agreed on a multiple contractors program of segmentation and diversification 
And on January 1, 1965, this program was initiated. We in Richland are grateful to the forward look and the combined efforts of the AEC, GE, the Tri-City Nuclear Industrial Council, the Chambers of Commerce, and many other groups and individuals, as well as the legislative people at both the state and national levels for making all this possible. A new Richland was born, and I'm sure I speak for the community when I say thank you for a job that has been done. We're all here to stay. There are among us tonight a very distinguished group of people that until today I had not had the privilege to meet and know, but like many of you from time to time have read and seen pictures and so forth and heard about them. Much has been contributed either directly or indirectly by these people to the many phases of the atomic energy program and so at this time, I would like to share with all of you who these people are by name and by sight. Because of the numbers that are involved of those to be introduced at this time, may I ask you if you will withhold your applause until all of them have been introduced and then will all of you join with me and give them a real, warm, Richland welcome. And the first that I'd like to present to you tonight is the gentleman from your right and my left, the Assistant General Manager of the Explosives Department, DuPont Company, Wilmington, Delaware, Dr. Lombard Squires. Dr. Squires? The first general manager, Richland Operations Atomic Energy Commission, was later named deputy general manager of the USAEC Washington, was later general manager of the Electric Boat Company, and then became the senior vice president of the General Dynamics Corporation, after which he retired, Mr. Carlton E. Shug. Mr. Shug? The fourth AEC Richland Operations General Manager, now retired and living on Bainbridge Island and was also a major in the Corps of Engineers during the construction of the project here with his wife, Mr. and Mrs. James E. Travis. Jim and Mrs. Travis? With his wife, Mr. and Mrs. James E. Travis. Jim and Mrs. Travis. Gentlemen who you heard about a moment ago, the very Reverend William J. Sweeney, and I'll pass over Reverend Sweeney because he's already had his show. <laughs> the next gentleman is the gentleman that I got to know as a result of in 1944, when one of the, and at that time, about the only service organization in the community was the Richland JCs. And at this time, 35 years of age is as old as you can be, but at that time, it was 40, and he just made it. He is the first Hanford Engineer Works project engineer, Manhattan District, and now is vice president of the Kaiser Engineers Company, Oakland, California, with his wife, Colonel Franklin T. Mathias and Mrs. Mathias. The next gentleman, if with your permission and with his, I will pass over. <laughs> The next lady that I'd like to introduce to you is the driving force behind the guy who made the welcome and the faux pas, the wife of our <laughs> mayor, 
Mrs. Dorothy Claggett. Dorothy? <laughs> Mayor Claggett, whom you've already heard from. And the gal that's the driving force behind me is my wife, Betty. The next gentleman I'll pass over with his permission. The delightful guy who this morning, along with others, entertained everyone. He was at Hanford in 1943 with the DuPont Company and is now the Director of Reactor Engineering, Atomic Energy Division, DuPont Company, Wilmington, Delaware, Dr. and Mrs. Dale Babcock. And always at one of these kind of things, there's always somebody that has to steal the glory of everybody, and this gentleman stole it this morning, in my opinion. He was a member of the, and I think, if I'm correct, the only member of the Chicago Pile Experiment on December 2, 1942, now with the Department of Nuclear Engineering at the University of Arizona, Tucson, Professor Norman Hilberry. Professor Hilberry. The gentleman I'm sure that many of us all know, because as I look around the house, I'm sure that, uh, that uh, he was here when you were here. The third general manager of the Richmond Operations Atomic Energy Commission and now vice president of the United Nuclear Corporation one of the co-venture companies with the Douglas Aircraft that make up the Douglas United Nuclear Incorporated, Mr. David F. Shaw. As I indicated to you earlier, he sent his regrets, but he sent his lovely wife, the wife of Commissioner Wilfred E. Johnson, former general manager of the General Electric Hanford Atomic Products Operation, Mrs. Esther Johnson. Esther? I don't know whether I dare say this, but I shall go ahead. I'm sure that when you get your Richland history book and you turn through the pages and you get along about there to 1958 and you see the commencement program and all the things that went with it, the only man that I know about in the history of the 25 years that we've been here that probably had the privilege of breaking out more glass windows and cracking more ceilings and causing more havoc than anybody else, the very genial Deputy General Manager of the United States Atomic Energy Commission, better known to us as Blockbuster, Edward J. Block. <laughs> Some of you will remember the assimilated atomic blast that was made in the uptown area, and I'm sure if Harold Morgan is in the house, he will remember better than anybody else because he lost a window. The next gentleman is from the Department of Chemistry the University of Texas, Austin, and I suspect this is probably as far away as any of them have come, who participated in the sessions at the 200 West area, Dr. George W. Watt. Dr. Watt. Then down on the next level, beginning on your right again, formerly with the Chicago Med Lab, the Manhattan District, and now with the Nuclear Energy Division, the General Electric Company at San Jose, Dr. Oz Greger. Dr. Greger? Probably one of the most modest gentlemen I have known, and had it not been for Professor Hilberry, I'm sure we would have never known the gentleman who heads up the Department of Physics at the Palmer Physical Laboratory, Princeton University, Princeton, New Jersey, 
Dr. John A. Wheeler. Dr. Wheeler. The next gentleman that I'd like to introduce to you is someone that I'm sure all of us became to love and know. He worked very hard in the early days of the Manhattan District, very close with General Groves and the many other people that had to do with this project. At that time, he was serving from the 4th District as the congressman in the United States House of Representatives. He lives now in Ellensburg, is retired, and until about a week ago, we had heard that he had been quite ill, and very much to our amazement, he was on the mend, was doing very well, and said, I'll be there. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you with his wife, Representative Mr. and Mrs. Hal B. Holmes from Ellensburg. And the gentleman who's occupying the end seat, who is now the present senator of the 8th District in the Washington State Senate, is secretary of the Washington Joint Committee on Nuclear Energy with his wife, the Honorable Damon R. Canfield and Mrs. Canfield. At this particular time, because of this, I would like to read to you a resolution by the Joint Committee on Nuclear Energy at its regular meeting, 25 May 1968, Seattle, Washington, whereas the city of Richland, Washington has set aside the days of June 6, 7, and 8 in 1968 to commemorate the significant historical occasions that mark Richland's contribution to America's progress in the fields of nuclear science and industry, and whereas these said aforementioned days represent the 25th year since ground was broken March 22, 1943 to establish the beginning of today's community and the 10th year since reincorporation of the city December 10, 1958 and whereas the mayor, city council, and prominent citizens of Richland, Washington have joined together to conduct a commemorative program of great importance to which distinguished leaders of the military, scientific, industrial, federal, and state establish establishments have been invited. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Joint Committee on Nuclear Energy for the State of Washington at their regular meeting on May 25, 1968, does hereby convey to the citizens of Richland, Washington, the officials of Richland, Washington, and to the distinguished participating leaders of America's nuclear science and industry, the committee's one, recognition of the importance of the planned commemorative action, and two, awareness of the significant contribution being made by the citizens of Richland, Washington to the furtherance of nuclear technology and application, and three, appreciation of the contribution such an event will make to verify that the state of Washington is truly the nuclear progress state, and four, highest respects and sincere wishes for the success of this memorable event that in itself will add significantly to the already long list of meaningful contributions made by our state to the citizens of Richland, Washington, and be it further resolved that the committee secretary, Senator Damon R. Canfield, officially represent this committee and transmit this resolution to the proper authorities at the 2510 anniversary celebration signed by Representative Robert L. Charette, Chairman, Joint Committee on Nuclear Energy, State of Washington. Now, I purposely passed over some of the people who were sitting at the second head table because it was in January 1, 1945, that began the segmentation and diversification of Hanford Works and as a result of the many wonderful things that have happened, and there are many more to come, in addition to these companies taking over the operation of the Hanford plant, 
They have made sizable contributions in building and operating laboratories and plants of various kinds. We in Richland welcome them, and at this time I would like to introduce them as the respective heads of the companies they represent, and again may I ask you to hold your applause, after which will you join with me and give all of the people at the head table a round of a, a warm Richland welcome. The first is Dr. Lawrence M. Richards, president of the Atlantic Richfield Hanford Company. Dr. Richards. The next, the director of the Pacific Northwest Laboratories, uh, the Battelle, I'm sorry, the Battelle Northwest Laboratories, Dr. and Mrs. Fred Albaugh. Dr. Albaugh, Mrs. Albaugh. The next gentleman is the president of the Douglas United Nuclear Corporation, Incorporated, Dr. and Mrs. Charles D. Harrington. The medical director of the Hanford Environmental Health Foundation, Dr. and Mrs. Philip Fuqua. The president of the ITT Federal Support Services, Incorporated, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Letty. General Manager of the J.A. Con Jones Construction Company, Mr. and Mrs. Ira Dunn. The next gentleman, I think, has the distinction of being the youngest, shall we say, of the contractors, Director of the Northwest, Northwest Division of Computer Sciences Corporation, Mr. Harold Leone. And last, but by no means least, the genial gentleman who's the manager of the Richland operations of the Atomic Energy Commission and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Donald J. Williams. Will you all join with me in a warm welcome for all of these people? kindly you're you're very patient and there were there are a lot of people here and we want to recognize them we want you to know who they are now we have some other guests in the audience who we'd like for you to know quickly we'll try to get through them first the gentlemen who were in, in cooperation with the city in the joint sponsorship of this banquet tonight the tri-city the tri-city nuclear industrial council the President, Mr. Robert F. Phillip, is a member of the Board of Regents of the Washington University, and Bob happened, I guess, happened to have to be, by virtue of this fact, in uh, Seattle for the graduation tomorrow. But we have the genial Vice President of that company, who is the President of the Richland Branch of the Old National Bank and the Vice President of the Tri-City Nuclear Council, and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Sam Bolpentest. Sam, I don't know where you are, but please stand. There he is. The next gentleman who, to beyond a doubt, without giving him any advertisement and so forth, who has helped immeasurably in doing many things that were necessary to let you know what we were doing, publisher of the Tri-City Herald and secretary of the Nuclear Council, Mr. Glenn Lee. Glenn? The other officer of the Nuclear Council who could not be here tonight, Cliff LeHue, who is the keeper of the Exchequer. The president of the, of the Northwest Public Power Association from Newport, Oregon, Mr. Forrest, Forrest A. Albright. Is Mr. Albright? There he is, way in the back. The president of the Association of Washington Cities, and if you'll hold your applause, uh, we'll get through much quicker. The president of the Association of Washington Cities from Bremerton, Washington, Mr. Austin Clark and Mrs. Clark. Where are they? There they are. From the Materials Engineering Laboratory, General Electric Company, Schenectady, New York, and an old-timer at Hanford and someone that I'm sure many of you know, 
Mr. Vance Cooper. Vance, where are you? There he is. The Executive Secretary, Northwest Public Power Association, Vancouver, Mr. Henry G. Curtis. Mr. Curtis? Someone who is new to our community, President of the Sterling Theaters Incorporated, Seattle, who just recently acquired the Mid-State Amusement Theaters, Mr. Fred Dance and Mrs. Dance. Where are they? The former DuPont manager of the Savannah River Operations and now the director of Manufacturing Division, Explosive Department, DuPont Company, Wilmington, Delaware, Mr. Julian Ellett. Where is Mr. Ellett? Way back. I'm not sure that this gentleman is here. He's a member of the Board of Regents of the University of Washington, a former Speaker of the House of Representatives, State of Washington, and owner-publisher of the book publishing company, Seattle, Washington, Mr. R. Mort Frayne and Mrs. Frayne, if they're here. We were not sure whether they would make it. The next gentleman, whom I'm sure is probably the guiding hand behind the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, a young man, I should say, who is a special assistant to the chairman from Washington, D.C., Dr. Arnold Fritsch. Dr. Fritsch. Formerly at the Chicago Med Lab and now with the Atlantic Richfield Hanford Company of Richland, Dr. and Mrs. Horace H. Hopkins. Where's Hoppy and his wife? They're way back. The managing director of the Washington Public Power Supply System, operators of Hanford Number no. 1 generating plant, and I'm sure all of you know where this is, from Kennewick, Mr. Owen Hurd and Mrs. Hurd. A school teacher who decided to seek public office, the state representative from District 16 from Kennewick, Mrs. Doris Johnson. The executive secretary, the executive director, Office of Nuclear Energy Develop, Development, Olympia, the official representative of Governor Dan Evans, and the governor again sends his best wishes and congratulations, Mr. Donald Koch. Where is he? There he is, way back. Formerly with the DuPont Company at Hanford and now the group leader, Radiochemistry Division, Lawrence Radiation Laboratories, Livermore, Dr. and Mrs. Manfred Lindner. Where are they? There they are. Dean of the Graduate School, University of Washington, and Chairman of the Governor's Advisory Council on Nuclear Energy, Seattle, Dr. Joseph L. McCarthy. The University of Washington representative to the Senator, to the Center for Graduate Study here in Richland, Dr. Wells Moulton. Is he here? Way back. Formerly of the Chicago Med Lab and now with Atlantic Richfield Hanford Company, Dr. and Mrs. Richard Rosenfeld. Formerly the first operations manager, Manhattan District Hanford Engineer Works, known then as Major and now Mr. Joe Sally. Dean of the Graduate School, Washington State University, and member of the Governor's Advisory Council on Nuclear Energy, Pullman, Dr. James Short, and his son. The Assistant Director of Programs, Division of Public Information, USAEC, Washington, D.C., Edwin E. Stokely. Ed, where are you? Way back.
a gentleman whom I'm sure was a great pleasure for us to know that he was to be here and one of those guys that got uprooted out of White Bluffs, the man who was the telephone operator at White Bluffs, the owner-manager of the White Bluffs Telephone Company, Mr. Dale S. Wilkinson. Mr. Wilkinson is, I think, 87 years old, and he's come from Seattle to be with us. We're happy to have him. Formerly with the Chicago Med Labs, DuPont, and General Electric Companies, and now Assistant Director of Operations Analysis and Forecasting, Dr. Joe B. Work. Dr. Work? I've got two more. Aren't you glad? I'd like to introduce to you the members of the City Council who are here tonight. Mr. and Mrs. Harold Morgan, Mayor Pro Tem. Harold, where are you? Mr. James Parcell, Jim. Mr. and Mrs. Jack Houston, Jack. Mrs. Kenneth Robertson, who is representing her husband, who is out of town. Where is Mrs. Robertson? There she is. Our city manager and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Murray W. Fuller. And the guy that has been an incredible amount of help to both Mr. Claggett and I for this celebration, our very genial bachelor assistant city manager, Mr. Ron Lockatour. Ron, where are you? Mr. W.K. McCready and Mrs. McCready, Chairman of the Benton County Commissioners. Back. Mr. Harry Kramer, another member of the Commissioners. Harry, and an old-timer, incidentally. And the guy that has been here a long, 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 long time, Mr. Wes Brown, the other member of the Commissioners. Wes, where are you? Thank you for being so very, very patient, and now we shall proceed. I have scheduled in my notes here that I uh, was going to call upon, and I had informed them that they would, but because of time, I hope they will not feel badly because we did not call on them. And that was, I was hoping that we might get a few comments from gentlemen like Colonel Mathias, Jim Travis, Carlton Shug, and Dave Shaw, who made up three of the five of the general managers for the Ritzman Operations Office and Colonel Mathias with General Clark now who's in Washington, D.C., and sent his regrets. But I'm sure they won't object, and we'd like to proceed to that part of the program that I'm sure you came to hear rather than hear me. What can be said has been said many times about the gentleman I'm about to introduce to you. His story and activity paralleled in interest the history and attainments of the Manhattan Engineer District the cover name given the United States government's atomic bomb project and its allied developments. Actually, he and the Manhattan District are synonymous. He not only selected its name, but for three years weighed his decisions in the face of a suspense and an uncertainty never before equaled. Clothed by the Secretary of War, Henry L. Stimson, in World War II's best-kept secret, he was the officer in charge of the atomic bomb project. He was born 71 years ago in the manse of the First Presbyterian Church in Albany, New York. He attended college at the University of Washington, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and entered West Point in 1916. He graduated fourth in his class from the academy in 1918 and was commissioned a second lieutenant. He has served in many capacities with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers 
all around the world, and as deputy chief of construction, he supervised the erection of the Pentagon building in Washington, D.C. In the summer of 1942, he became associated with the atomic bomb project, and after the green light was given to proceed by President Roosevelt on the building of the project, General Groves kept the President, the Secretary of War, advised of the progress. General Groves personally established and supervised the security policies, and so, com so compartmentalized was the construction, operational, and production phases of the venture that only a few persons ever knew its full and complete implications and objectives. General Groves laid down the selection of the areas in Tennessee and in Washington for the Clinton Engineer Works Oak Ridge and for the Hanford Engineer Works at Richland and for placing the ultra-secret utilization project at the site it now occupies in Los Alamos, New Mexico. When it could be told after the atomic bomb drops, it was said he was the driving force behind a $2 billion calculated risk which was successfully completed in three years as one of the world's greatest scientific and engineering achievements, the large-scale tapping of energy within atoms to produce a new weapon of war. He is retired from the United States Army in 1948 and became vice president of the Remington Division Sperry Rand Corporation, remaining there until 1961. He holds many decorations for his illustrious service in the Army, and it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome him back to Hanford to help us commemorate this occasion and present him to you, ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Leslie R. Grove. This afternoon, Dr. Seaborg and I made an agreement as to how long we would, our total talks would amount to, and uh, I'm going to keep what I agreed to, although I could, of course, talk for the whole time, and then he could just say good evening. <coughs> I'm not going to uh, give you any uh, formal discussion of anything. I'm going to tell you a few of the facts of life as they were back in 1942 and 43. I'd like to uh, uh, tell you first that there was a mistake made earlier about uh, when the first ground was broken at Hanford. It was actually broken on January 16, 1943, when I saw the site for the first time and uh, scratched around with my foot to see what kind of foundations we'd have for fast construction. <laughs> uh, previous to that, uh, Colonel Matthias and two DuPonters, Mr. Church and Mr. Hall, made this tour for me to look for a site. And we, we started out because in uh, inducing, and I think that's a mild word to use, the DuPont Company to participate. Uh, I agreed with Mr. Carpenter, who sat as one of his conditions, and he fortunately didn't know that I already felt the same way, that the work should probably not be done at, at Oak Ridge, and if he found out that he didn't want to do it at Oak Ridge, I would not object to moving it somewhere else. Well, I didn't want to do it at Oak Ridge either, but I always like to give in and let somebody have his own way when that's what I want anyway. Uh, <laughs> Colonel Matthias can tell you a lot of things about that. Uh, after the meeting in Wilmington, uh, at which the criteria were more or less established as to what was necessary from a safety standpoint, uh, these three gentlemen started out to make their tour. 
I would add that on December 1st, the DuPont Company had agreed to undertake the work. And their work was to design and develop from an engineering standpoint to construct and to operate what became the Hanford plant. After the, before the exploratory mission started out, I talked to them for a few minutes and I told uh, them that just where the plant was going to be. Uh, as most of you may know, I'd been uh, connected with construction. I'd been all over the country. I'd lived in many parts of it, including the state of Washington, but on the other side of the mountains. And I uh, knew the country very well. We also knew where the power was. And I uh, told Colonel Mathias, uh, just where this plant would probably be. And I thought you might be interested in that. It was horse heaven. Uh, <laughs> so you see that uh, any of you who served in the Army, a personal reconnaissance is all, not always necessary. At any rate, uh, we came awfully close to the site. I'd done the same thing with connection with, uh, with Oak Ridge. There I'd merely said that it should be within about 30 to 35 miles from Knoxville. At Los Alamos, I had said that it should be near uh, Santa Fe, or rather near Albuquerque. And uh, dis I disapproved the uh, site at, that had been selected for Los Alamos, what became Los Alamos. And later that day, we went over the Los Alamos site, and I approved that. When I came out here, uh, we'd already uh, sent real estate officers out here to look over the situation and to make their plans as to how the land would be condemned. And I was supposed to meet Colonel Mathias here to go over the site. Colonel Mathias, though, uh, failed to arrive. Uh, he told me afterwards, I think it was either plane or train difficulty, it was a pretty good alibi, and he had people to support him, so I couldn't say too much. But uh, I went all over the site with this real estate officer and uh, agreed, in my mind, that it was a splendid site in every direction. Of course, when we got to Hanford itself, uh, we, we had lunch there, and I can still remember the little uh, general store on the corner and uh, I was in uniform, and of course they weren't accustomed to seeing uh, uh, general officers, and the, it was winter, and I had an, a, an overcoat on, a short coat, and of course had the big black uh, bands on my sleeve. But I think these men, almost all of whom were veterans of World War I, I doubt if they'd seen many generals in their lives, but it made no difference to them. Uh, they welcomed me into their midst, and I listened to their... Uh, noonday chatter, which apparently went on all day long. Um, in general, uh, Hanford at that time looked just like the sagebrush, that is mean as an area, but looked just like the sagebrush fields you see as you go up towards the reactor uh, locations. Uh, that was the general impression. There was not uh, the land didn't become valuable agriculturally until we started to condemn it. <laughs> and uh, uh, I've often, uh, I found that in dealing with Congress particularly, it is always well to be able to admit to some mistakes that you didn't mind their knowing about anyway. The ones you didn't want them to know, you'd never admitted to. But one of the mistakes that we made was that in connection with the time of condemnation. Uh, there was, it would have been very unwise from a uh, strategic political standpoint to move the people off as soon as we uh, wanted to, as uh, soon as the reservation was set up because the crops had been made. Uh, they were about, uh, they would have been harvested by June, most of them. And I just felt it was wiser not to run into that objection that somebody would be sure to talk about. Well, unfortunately, they had the best crop they'd had in about 20 years. 
and the prices were high. And the uh, condemnation suits that were brought to court were settled in Yakima, and the juries were Yakima farmers who were used to Yakima production prices. And, uh, and we paid an awful lot for this land, much more than uh, I thought was reasonable. But uh, that was done. I always uh, think it's very important to realize that no matter how well anyone does a job, you always make mistakes. And usually those mistakes come about through uh, an attempt to be reasonable or to be kind or to do something else. When we broke, uh, when from that time on, this thing moved along very smoothly. Uh, there were a few difficulties, but not too many. We had trouble getting labor. We had all the things that you've all heard about. Uh, but I wanted to give you that first impression and how we happened to come here. The one of, there were several reasons. One was power. One was the Columbia River. And uh, we were more fortunate in that than we realized when we made the choice. And the other thing was that, which was all important, was an ability to construct the year around, and despite all the venomous remarks that have been made about the dust storms, you could work out there. And uh, from the letters I get from my son in Vietnam, the dust there outside of the rainy season is much worse than it ever was in Hanford. And also, nobody was shooting at you. Uh, the other uh, thing that I think is important to remember is what made this project as a whole a success. Uh, actually, it was the triumph of what I've always termed the American way of life. And I think one of the most important features in that was the role played by American management. And that meant the management of these big corporations and the, man the sub-management of those corporations. We'd always thought, those of us who uh, were, uh, had been around the country, that nothing could be much bigger than DuPont. But you know, this project strained the DuPont uh, uh, resources to the limit. They had to abandon one uh, munitions plant and turn it over to another company because they simply needed the people out here. And we had, for example, the man who took over the commissary when we had trouble with it, who was an engineer. I think we still retained the original subcontractor. But before he came out here, he'd been the general manager in the construction of the Gopher Ordnance Plant near Minneapolis. And that was only a hundred million dollar job. People who had been managers of uh, smaller installations, maybe 35 million or something like that, came out here and were assistant area superintendents. And that was what uh, we thought was necessary to do the job. Uh, the, uh, the idea of, of something like the pile uh, having to be uh, generally uh, a cube uh, and, and accurate to a quarter of an inch was something that's unheard of in construction activities. It just hadn't been done. That was the type of thing that was fine machine work uh, for things like automobiles when uh, we weren't so disturbed about safety requirements as we seem to be today. But uh, that was typical of it. Everything was new. We spent, uh, we didn't know how to uh, make the metal. We didn't know how to can the metal. In fact, we hardly learned how to can it in time. Uh, we didn't, uh, uh, there's so many things that were unknown. When I first talked to uh, the DuPont company, uh, I asked two of their senior vice presidents, one of whom I knew, to come to Washington to talk to me. And I told them what I wanted. And they uh, uh, sort of uh, threw up their hands in horror. And, and their first remark, and what I've heard from DuPont for years, was that we're chemists, we're not physicists. And there was some question as to even, whether they even had one physicist on their payroll. Uh, I think the first real physicist who joined them and worked with them uh, was uh, Dr. Wheeler, and uh, they leaned on him so heavily I was always uh, surprised that his back didn't break. 
of course, he was uh, more in a physicist. He was the most unusual one. And uh, we had a lot of unusual ones, but not unusual in that way. He understood the problems of the engineer and of the whole business world, and he uh, had the DuPont organization eating out of his hand. All they could say to me was, can't you find a few more like Dr. Wheeler to come up and help us? Uh, some of the others were a little bit difficult at times. Uh, but uh, the physicists managed to put across this great, uh, uh, it isn't the first time the American people have been brainwashed, uh, but they put across the great idea that the physicists did this job. Well, uh, everybody did this job. And among the scientists, uh, don't forget the chemists. After all, I think the chemi this was really more chemistry than it was physics in a lot of ways. And I know tonight that Dr. Seaborg will not disagree with me on that question. Uh, but the physicists had been hungry for years. They'd never received any attention. The chemists were, were used to... Uh, the chemists were used to dealing with industry. The physicists were in their laboratories and colleges and more or less, uh, I imagine, a little bit disgruntled because of the consulting fees that their brethren in the chemistry department usually got. But in any case, uh, this was one uh, a field that required every possible bit of scientific effort we could put on it. It required physics. It required chemistry, it required biology. And when it came to building, it required all the things that go into making, being able to design things like you saw in the tunnel today, all of which of course had to be capable of being taken apart uh, by remote control. All of that design work, it had to work, and it had to work almost the first time. Uh, you've all heard about the xenon poisoning that's been referred to today, but I'd like to point out that the reason we got into trouble out here was because the physicists in Chicago thought they knew more than they did. And they, uh, they failed to obey the direct orders that I had given that that experimental pilot Chicago be run 24 hours a day around the clock all through the weeks and through the months. Of course, if they'd only run it for, instead they said they, afterwards, they explained that they'd gotten all the information they needed during the daylight hours, so they had, uh, just knew it wasn't necessary to do that. Of course, if they'd done it for even 18 hours, xenon would have been predicted. And the, uh, uh, there were a few times that we had to uh, interfere with some of the scientific prognostications one of those was, in connect, was the thing that saved the piles, and that was the provision of the extra tubes. Uh, when that, was, that got, became such an acrimonious argument between DuPont and the Chicago physicists that uh, Mr. Reed, the chief engineer came, of DuPont, came to see me about it. And uh, he apparently thought that it would take a long argument. And as soon as he told me that... Uh, the physicists wanted to design this right down to the, to the finest point with no margin of, of safety. I uh, said, well, I hope you've uh, put in at least 25% safety factor as a minimum. And uh, he was so surprised he almost fell out of his chair. He, he didn't have to argue at all. It was just a common sense engineering approach. And uh, as you know, that's what saved the Hanford piles. Uh, all I can say is it's been very embarrassing for me to have to uh, tell the Secretary of War or the Chief of Staff that Hanford had failed because we were too stupid to use normal engineering precautions. But to get down to what made this a success, and I'd like to tell you that and leave that thought with you. It was the triumph of the American way of life, American management, the uh, government support that we got, the unlimited authority that I had, and I wasn't given that authority. Uh, I was given sort of, I was just told to take charge. 
And then I found out after a little while that nobody wanted to interfere with me because they couldn't understand what we were talking about. And they also were certain that it was a wild goose chase and would be a failure, and they didn't want to have any responsibility for that failure. <laughs> uh, make no mistake about it, I knew what my chances were, and I, I estimated them as about 60% to be able to do it during the war. But I still told General Marshall that I thought we should go ahead primarily uh, because of the dangers of the Germans getting there first and also because I didn't believe that we could finish it in time of peace under our American way of operation. Then we had the uh, support of the state and local authorities. We had it out here particularly strongly. We had the support of the newspapers in keeping our security. And we had the a tremendous advantage in the number and the youth of our American scientists who had been uh, increasing in great numbers during the Depression years and who were uh, young enough not to realize that it couldn't be done. Now that was really the basis of it. As Dr. Seaborg told you today, he was 30 when he went to Chicago. Uh, he had uh, a compatriot who was the head of chemistry at uh, Los Alamos, Dr. Joe Kennedy, who I think was 27 at the time. And uh, those were the men we depended on, but we also uh, uh, tried to see to it that their, what their recommendations were were sound, that they knew what they were talking about, that they weren't just some uh, curbstone opinion. 